So the first time I encountered the word proxy in my life was during my college days. The word proxy was used in association with attendance. Someone didn't want to attend the class, you set up a friend as an attendance proxy. So when the lecturer calls out your name during attendance roll call, this friend responds and you're marked as present. Okay, that's the proxy when I was in college. Now, you tend to hear these two terms a lot in uh, software. You have proxy, you can have reverse proxy especially when you're working with backend systems, proxy servers and reverse proxy servers. Are they the same? If not, what are they? What are, how are they different? In this video, I will break this down and give you a very clear idea with examples of what proxy is, what reverse proxy is, and how they are different. And you'll realize the concept of proxy is not too far removed from this idea of proxy attendance in college and you're trying to trick the lecturer. And reverse proxy is where the lecturer is trying to trick you. Well, kind of. Let me explain. So there's one important thing that underlines all this discussion about proxies and reverse proxy. It is the direction of data transfer, okay? Direction of information exchange. You first need to understand who is sending the data or information and to whom. What is the source and what is the destination? Who is the client and who is the server? Once you've identified that, both proxy and reverse proxy is pretty much the same thing except in different directions, okay? So let's first understand proxy and then we can pretty much reverse it and you will understand reverse proxy. Okay, so the Oxford English Dictionary definition of proxy is a person authorized to act on the behalf of another. You have proxy voting, right? Where someone votes on behalf of another person. Or even proxy attendance example we've seen where your friend answers the roll call. There are a couple of places in a typical web application flow where having a proxy makes sense and is very common. So you type in a URL and you hit enter. Let's say you want to enter javabrains.io on your browser and submit. Your request doesn't directly go to the website. There's your internet service provider, for example, sitting in between you and the website who takes your request and then sends another request to the website. Of course, there could be multiple other steps as well in between, but assuming the simple picture, your internet service provider or ISP is acting as a proxy for you. Okay, it's sending a request on your behalf and that's really what a proxy is. Another common example of proxy is found in workplaces. Some workplaces block certain websites, right? Offices block certain websites and they monitor websites that employees use. Well, how do they do that? Well, they certainly cannot do that if the employee is allowed to make a request to a website directly. No, they need to get in the middle and they do this by using a proxy. When an employee requests a website, they're actually talking to this proxy and the proxy then makes sure that this isn't some unsafe or pornographic website and then it makes the request on behalf of you. Here's how a proxy typically looks like. You have multiple clients behind a proxy server. These are typically multiple computers in one network. A typical office network would look something like this. A proxy receives requests from many clients and then it makes requests to wherever the request actually needs to go. And then it waits for the corresponding responses and then sends the right responses to the right clients who initiated those corresponding requests. So why do we do this? There are a couple of advantages in having a proxy. First, like we've seen, a proxy can intercept your request and decide not to pass a request along in the case of blocked websites. You can also choose to log or monitor requests. It's uh, easy for organizations to enforce these uh, restrictions and security in one place, which is the proxy, rather than on each individual employee's computer. Another advantage is that the proxy can cache requests instead of passing it uh, through each time. Let's say there is a certain static page that's accessed by multiple people and close to each other in terms of request times. The proxy can make just one request and then cache it. When there are subsequent calls to the same page, the proxy will just return the cache response rather than make a new request again. But overall, the most important thing that you should remember about a proxy is that the server or the receiver doesn't know where the request is coming from or who the client is because of this kind of a decoy or a proxy. Now you might wonder, well, how does this work with authenticated pages? So let's say you've logged into Google Mail, okay? 
and you make this request as yourself and it goes to the proxy. Now the proxy is making a request to Gmail servers on your behalf. Well then, when Google gets the proxy's request, how does it know it's you and send the response with your inbox contents? Well, it's very simple. What a proxy does is actually take your request as is and make the exact same request from itself. Okay, so now if this request is authenticated, it might contain cookies or JWTs or something else which identifies this authenticated session. So in that sense, the server kind of knows what the request is, but not where the request is coming from. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So this is proxy and it's often referred to as forward proxy. Okay, in contrast to this is another concept called reverse proxy. As you can imagine, this is a reverse concept. While forward proxy is meant to proxy requests going out or forward, a reverse proxy is meant to proxy requests coming in. What kind of things have requests coming in? Yup, they're servers, okay? So if forward proxies are for clients, reverse proxies are for servers. Imagine you have hosted an application on like a handful of servers. They could be microservices with different endpoints on these servers, or they could be multiple scaled copies of the same application. Now, rather than have the client be aware of the nuances of how you have set up your servers, you set up a proxy server in front of these servers. This proxy is responsible for getting requests from the outside world and then make the right requests to the right server, get the response, and then send that response to the right client. The principle is kind of the same. In this case, the client doesn't know what the actual server is that's handling the request. This is proxy, but in the reverse direction, hence called reverse proxy. So what are the advantages of reverse proxy? Well, security is an advantage again. When you host your application and start accepting requests, you can set up a reverse proxy that manages the security of your application. You can protect against denial of service attacks. You can do rate limiting. You can set up a firewall and you can stop hackers, bots, or other malicious requests. And since your actual server IPs are hidden from the client, it makes your infrastructure a little more secure. Another advantage is caching. You can cache certain responses so that when the request comes in, you can send the response back without even bothering the server with it. However, one very common use of reverse proxy is load balancing. When you have a scaled application server, that is, you can start up multiple instances of your same app server, and depending on the load, you can increase or decrease the number of uh, instances, you would want this incoming traffic to be evenly distributed across these server instances. And this is a great use for the reverse proxy as a load balancer. This load balancer reverse proxy can use a strategy like round robin to evenly distribute requests to the available servers. And the clients have no idea about it, just like it should be. So now you know the difference between forward proxy and reverse proxy. And you also know that load balancer is a specific use case of the reverse proxy. One common pattern of using reverse proxy, at least in the case of microservices, in the context of microservices, is as an API gateway. So go check out this video to learn what an API gateway is all about.